It's um, an honor to introduce Aaron Goley from uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, and Aaron, I'm looking forward to hearing your living history. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for the chance uh, to be here and to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, how I got to where I am. I thought I would briefly just say who I am and where I am, so it makes sense as we go through my trajectory. Um, I'm an associate professor in biological chemistry at Johns Hopkins, um, and I consider myself a bacterial cell biologist. Um, my lab is interested in understanding really fundamental mechanisms by which bacteria are organized in space, how they do morphogenesis, how they grow, how they divide, how they adapt to changing environments. Um, and the kind of primary tools we use are a lot of imaging, in vitro biochemistry, and bacterial genetics. And I'll just highlight that we use two alpha proteobacterial model systems to approach these questions. One is a, a purely sort of experimental or model system called Colobacter crescentis with anyone who knows Shree's work has, has maybe seen some work on Colobacter. It's a really beautiful model for understanding bacterial organization. It has this asymmetric cell division that's, that's very um, hardwired. Um, and so it's, it's easy to ask questions of spatial and temporal organization in that bug. Um, and in the last couple of years, we've added a complementary system, a sort of cousin to Colobacter that has a completely different lifestyle. It's an obligate intracellular uh, human pathogen. So its, its cell biology has been constrained by evolution, um, co-evolution with a eukaryotic host for, for many, many years. And so we're currently um, pursuing these questions of morphogenesis and adaptation in these two complementary systems with, with different lifestyles. Where I started um, was in Rhode Island. I grew up in what we call the biggest little state in the union. Um, and I grew up in a big family. So I'm third of six siblings and my, my siblings and, and in-laws and my mom and nieces and nephews and, and kids are shown in this picture here. Um, and my siblings were my best friends growing up. I was pretty introverted because I just had all these people around me um, all the time to hang out with. Um, and I think that Kind of in, in big families like this, we all kind of take on an identity, and I was always the academic uh, one or the smart one. Um, and so I did well in school. I really liked math. I really liked science. And those were the kinds of things that I, I really enjoyed um, academically growing up. Um, I want to give a shout out to my parents, who I think um, helped to shape the way that I work and the way that I pursue the, the way that I do science. Um, my mom, Christy, was a nurse. So both my parents were in medicine. Um, my mom was a nurse. Um, she got her nursing degree when she was like 20 years old um, and then worked usually two or three jobs at a time to support all the kids she had um, and eventually went back to school to get her bachelor's and then her master's to become a nurse practitioner. So she was the most hard, is the most hardworking person I know and she really instilled that um, in myself and my siblings. She also taught me incredible generosity. She always kind of puts other people um, before her and always is thinking about what might, what might I do for someone else. And this is something that I, I think she instilled in me. And I, I try to think about, you know, what, what can I offer in terms of my time and my expertise to my, my mentees or to sort of my colleagues and collaborators who are very sort of open and sharing ideas in our science. Um, and that's something that, that I think I got from my mom. The other person who was really formative to me growing up and inspiring me to be interested in kind of the natural world and in biology was my stepfather. Um, he passed about nine years ago, but um, he was a pediatrician and he had a, a private practice in this old 19th century school building in our, time, in our town. Um, and he um, used to let us do little odd jobs in the office. So I spent quite a bit of time kind of doing things like making little packets of penicillin as samples uh, when, when kids got strep throat to give out. And this is really my first introduction to microbiology. He would um, you know, swab kids' throat if he suspected they had strep throat. And back then, this is in the 80s when I was a kid, we didn't have the rapid test. So he actually had to streak out those swabs on blood agar, which I thought looked weird and gross, but also super, super cool. He would streak them out and put them on top of the refrigerator, which was the warmest place in his office, um, and then look a day or so later to see if there was strep growing. And so this was absolutely my first introduction to bacteria. I won't say it was an aha moment. I wasn't like, oh gosh, I have to understand how these bugs work, but I was fascinated by it. Um, and he was fascinated by the biological world and really um, inspired that curiosity in me um, as well. Um, so at the end of um, high school, um, as I said, I was pretty shy and introverted and I decided that I, I should maybe try to get away from home, move away from my sort of safe sphere of my family. Um, and 
go to an environment where maybe I could build a little confidence. And so I, I went to a small liberal arts college um, that happened to be a women's college. I thought maybe I would be more comfortable having a, a louder voice in an all women environment. So this is Hood College, actually not too far from where I am now in Frederick, Maryland. Um, and this is where I had my first exposure to research. I did a, a little summer stint there learning how to culture HeLa cells and do transfections. It was my first introduction to molecular biology and I really enjoyed that. I liked the sort of working with your hands that you can do. Um, and I, I also really loved my organic chemistry classes during undergrad and was inspired by my organic chemistry professor to think about maybe trying research in organic chemistry. And so I spent a summer at the University of Utah, which was really um, motivating and inspiring in a few ways. One, it was my first time kind of off the East Coast and far away from home. It was my first time in a really research intensive environment where there were PhD students and postdocs and um, you know, heavily resourced research going on. Um, and it was beautiful and, and I had a fantastic summer um, doing science out there. I did, however, learn that I did not want to do organic synthesis um, as a career, um, which is also good to learn what you don't want to do. Um, and I just want to highlight that, you know, I would feel like I've been fairly naive moving through my career and I've benefited by having fantastic mentors who recognize things in me that I didn't recognize in myself and sort of pointed me towards opportunities like doing undergraduate research um, or doing an honors thesis research, um, which I did at the USDA um, during my senior year. And so, so I, I thank all my mentors. So at the end of undergrad, I kind of had a crisis. I did not know what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about medicine. I thought about being a forest ranger. I thought about going into the Peace Corps. Um, but again, I had a fantastic mentor who offered me an opportunity that turned out to be really great. Um, this was um, one of my former professors, Doug Luster, who's pictured here on the, on the right. Um, he ran a lab at the USDA and he offered me a position as a lab technician. And so for two years, I, I was a lab tech and I, I basically was running kind of molecular characterizations of different viral and fungal pathogens um, that were entering the US um, and kind of doing molecular fingerprinting on those. And so I really loved doing that molecular research. I loved being at the bench all day long. I loved working in a team with a team of scientists. Um, so those were all really fantastic things that I learned. I also really learned to love microbes, um, but I also didn't like the really super applied kind of research I was doing. And I thought it might be, um, I might be more suited to doing more kind of hypothesis driven research. So at the end of that experience, I decided to apply to graduate school. I actually thought what I would do was apply to graduate school and end up maybe teaching at a small college like the one that I had gone to, probably because I was naive and I hadn't really experienced much else. Um, but um, I did apply to grad school and I ended up going to UC Berkeley. I was looking for programs that had strengths in microbiology and molecular biology. Um, and so I ended up going to the MCB molecular and cell biology program at Berkeley. And all of the labs that I rotated in um, were studied microbiology, either bacteriology or virology. But they also all looked at how pathogens interact with the cytoskeleton and specifically with the actin cytoskeleton. And I ended up joining the lab of Matt Welch, who's, who's pictured here. And Matt has been a tremendous mentor um, to me throughout my career, still a good friend and mentor. And I, I feel really fortunate to have um, benefited from his mentorship. And so in Matt's lab, I became a cell biologist. You know, I was motivated to go do microbiology and I, I really fell in love with cell biology. I loved kind of thinking about molecules and how they come together in a cell, how the cell can, um, you know, change shape or move things around via cytoskeletal based movements. Um, and I fell in love with the cytoskeleton. And so that's what I really studied. I studied how actin is nucleated in the cell. Um, and as well as a little bit of host pathogen interactions, I did some work looking at how a, a virus actually translocates actin into the nucleus, this completely bizarre thing that it does to potentiate its own replication. Um, and, um, and so this motivated both my love for cell biology, but also maintained my interest in microbes. And so when I, um, at this point, I decided, you know, I thought I wanted to teach at a small college, but by the time I finished my PhD, I really wanted to run a lab. And so I pursued a postdoc um, and now I was looking for something that maybe I could use my skills in cell biology and my interests in microbiology to kind of carve a little niche for myself. Um, and so I decided to join a bacterial cell biology lab. So at the time, in kind of the early to mid 2000s, um, bacterial cell biology was a very new thing. The bacterial cytoskeleton is, was a really new thing. And I was excited to kind of jump into this, this new area of research. I joined Lucy Shapiro's lab at Stanford. Lucy's kind of the godmother of bacterial cell biology, if you will. 
And um, that's where I started working on colobacter, working on cell division, morphogenesis, and the cytoskeleton um, in this bacterium. And I think one thing that I really drew from Lucy's lab that has been um, inspiring is how multidisciplinary it was. Um, she ran a lab with her husband, who was a physicist. She's a biologist. She also had chemists and engineers in the lab. Um, and so there really was this incredibly multidisciplinary group. And I learned so much um, from, my, from my lab mates and from Lucy and her husband, Harley, um, about how you can really throw all kinds of approaches at a biological question to make, um, to make progress. Um, so that kind of was the end of my training and, and I moved on to Hopkins. I did wanna take a little bit of an aside to talk about um, how my life as a queer person in STEM has kind of paralleled my training. It's Pride Month and this is something that I've you know, gone through through the entire time of my time being a scientist. And I feel like I truly have been living history because for anyone who's paid attention to the history of sort of marriage equality and LGBTQ rights, so much has happened over the last 25 years. So, you know, I feel not that old, but um, I started dating my wife at the time I graduated college. We wanted to get married in 2004. There was no marriage um, for same-sex couples in California where we lived. So we had a domestic partnership. It's kind of all we could do really at the time. Um, but then in 2008, California started granting same-sex marriages. And so we got married. Um, a year later, we had a kid. And then we moved to Maryland to, to start my position at Hopkins. Marriage was not legal here, so it was very scary, um, but it became legalized a year later. And so that was super exciting. Um, we had another kid in 2014. And then in 2015, finally federal marriage, uh, for same-sex marriage was, was recognized. And so it felt like this entire, this huge win and that we had gone really, really far over a very short period of time. Um, but I'll just mention that, of course, anyone who pays attention to the news, you may know that, you know, there's still a lot of sort of anti-LGBTQ um, elements out there. There's been a lot of anti-trans legislation in recent years, so I feel like we're really still fighting. We've come a very long way, um, and I, I will say that I've always had queer mentors. I had professors both during undergraduate and graduate who were openly gay, and so I always felt comfortable being kind of my authentic self. And I feel super fortunate for that and try to be very open in my own kind of professional life as well so that there's representation for those who are coming uh, behind me. So um, that's what I wanted to share. Um, coming back to today, I feel like I've come a little bit full circle. This um, bacterium uh, rickettsia that we added recently to the lab actually interacts with host actin. And so I feel like I'm a little full circle back to my graduate days and my interest in the cytoskeleton. And I just wanna say that I, I find sort of the most joy in my job from working with other people. So I'm really lucky to have fantastic graduate students and postdocs that I get to work with every day to interact with um, who are doing, you know, who are incredible people and who, who keep life interesting. And also, you know, again, inspired by Lucy, I collaborate with a ton of people because I think, you know, being able to integrate all kinds of different approaches from, you know, chemistry and structural biology and physics um, to push questions forward a, it's super fun to work with other people, but it also allows you to take kind of new insights and look at your problems in new ways. So I will end there. Great. Thank you, Erin, for a fantastic talk. And I'm clapping on behalf of everyone in the audience. Um, everyone who has any questions, feel free to leave those uh, in the chat. Um, and uh, I'll start with a question, actually. So you, know, you were describing this um, this timeline just now of these different achievements, and um, that must have been very difficult with the uncertainty, like moving across the country to a new position. And how did you um, balance that with the optimism? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I, I will say, at the time, it was scary. So we had, we had a child, and at the time, we had my son in California we were married uh, according to California. And so my wife was on his birth certificate, but we were very worried about moving to another state um, where he might not be recognized as her child. And so she adopted him. So we kind of jumped through all the hoops we could to kind of protect ourselves um, in moving. You know, I, I actually completely avoided parts of the country where I thought we wouldn't live, be able to live comfortably in terms of applying for jobs. I didn't I kind of avoided the entire middle. <laughs> and I'm just lucky that I had the, you know, I was able to do that and still find a position in a place that that I feel really comfortable. But it was definitely something on our minds and lucky that Maryland, Maryland is a pretty democratic progressive state as well. So um, we were lucky that kind of things came around the next year or so. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, 
Yeah, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, pass it over to uh, Tashrina for um, uh, the next talk. Thank you again, Aaron.